And I'd like to welcome everybody who attending, both uh, the attendees and uh, the speakers. I'm, we're very grateful. But let's kick this off with the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. These are the guys that are uh, basically has done the big study that's about to be released. And that, uh, that, that is the TMDL, a term that you're going to hear a ton of today. I did give you a little cheat sheet. There's a glossary over there so that you, you, can, uh, you can translate to English some of, the, some of the terms and acronyms that they'll use almost on a continuous basis. So we're lucky to have anybody here from the Minnesota Police Control Agency. They're all testifying in front of the, uh, down at the legislature. So it's been a real running battle, but uh, Bob Finley has showed up and he's the Southeast Regional Manager. He's just gonna have a couple of uh, introductory remarks. So, Bob. Yeah, th <laughs> thanks Mike. We. Uh I appreciate being here. I won't hold you responsible for the for the weather. I really thank uh, thank you and your staff and and all the people in the Legacy Alliance for for pulling this together in this wonderful, marvelous uh, setting. Um, as Mike said, I'm uh, you know I'm probably the second or third choice. I know some of you are expecting to see uh, Commissioner Austin, and I'm sure you would like to be here, um, but. You may be disappointed, but I'm not disappointed because if he was here, then I then I wouldn't be. And I was kind of anxious to come down here and see what was going on. And actually, it's good that we keep uh, keep Commissioner and also Galen up in St. Paul, uh, watching watching the store for us. Um, we're talking today, thinking big about the Great River and Lake Pepin, and I think that's just a wonderful image. Uh, I think a lot about the complexity and the difficulty of the Lake Pepin. Uh, TMDL study, uh, the South Metro Mississippi, the Minnesota River, and I'm always reminded of something I believe uh, Einstein said decades ago about complex problems that we face in society. And he always he said that the complex pro problems we face cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. And that's why I think this is a wonderful theme, thinking big, but I also think it should be thinking imaginatively and creatively and boldly about what we can do for the South Metro Mississippi, Lake Pepin, and uh, the Minnesota River. I think we should just reflect, because coming from the Pollution Control Agency, we've done, as Mike pointed out, we've done a lot of research, a lot of studies, and not, it's not just the Pollution Control Agency, it's also the Met Council, many local groups, the University of Minnesota, State of Wisconsin, there's a long list of work that's gone on here uh, around, this, around this resource over the last probably five to seven years. And if we just reflect on this, on this larger narrative, uh, we come to realize that we have amassed a great deal of understanding, a great deal of knowledge. Uh, we have a real good sense of the nature and extent of the problem that's confronting us here. Um, and not only in Lake Pepin and in the Mississippi River, but if you go further than that, we've amassed a great deal of knowledge and understanding about the nature and extent of pollution sources in the Minnesota River, which as everyone knows, is the primary source of sediment to the, to the Mississippi. And if we want to even go further than that, we look at the major watersheds as we're doing over the course of the next several years in uh, all across the state of Minnesota, but in particular within, within the Minnesota River. And we, we've learned a great deal about the nature and extent of the transport of sediment in those watersheds as well. So that puts us in a very, very favorable position. And what really is going to make this work, because those of us at the Pollution Control Agency and those of us that work at other agencies can only take this so far. What will really make this work is for the people, <clears throat> many of you are in this room today, and I know you have friends and colleagues that are not here today, but that's what's going to make this work, is for you people to become motivated and inspired and energized. And we see signs of that happening all the time. We see meetings, we see conversations, we see um, you know, social media events. We see documentaries such as the one we have 
on the Minnesota River going right now. We see friendship tours between Pepin and the Minnesota River people uh, upstream. And those are the kind of things that are going to be a catalyst for change in this part of the state. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> today we have an impressive lineup of subject material and people that are knowledgeable and experienced. Uh, our next speaker just mentioned to me that he's been looking or studying or working on the Chesapeake Bay <coughs> for 26 years. <coughs> I've been working, excuse me, <coughs> I've been working probably for that long in the Minnesota River, which is, I don't know, I don't know how the Minnesota compares to the Chesapeake. I think it's, I think it's just as important. Uh, but I, I appreciate, I appreciate the difficulty of sustaining an effort for a couple of years, let alone 26 years. So I think, uh, I think we should uh, pay close attention to what, to what he has to say about their experiences because I think we have a great deal to learn. So we're also going to learn more about some of the um, research that's going on here um, in, in our locality and what that means to us and how that can uh, act as a catalyst or a motivation for us to carry forward. So with that, I want to say welcome to everyone. Uh, I want to say this a pleasure for me uh, to be here to meet with all of you. And I also want to say that many of you are and continue to be an inspiration to the rest of us. So with that, I will turn it over back to Mike. You want to introduce the, the next speaker? I will. Okay. Okay, um, we have too many speakers today, so I will have to read some of this off. But uh, our next speaker is uh, Richard Batuk. He goes by Rich. He prefers it. And uh, Rich is uh, the Associate Director of, for Science at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Chesapeake Bay Program office loca located in Annapolis, Maryland. In his 25 years with the EPA, the Chesapeake Bay Program, he has led the integration of the science into multi-partner decision-making. He is now focused on helping lead the effort to the EPA's recent publication of the Watershed Wide Bay TMDL Pollution Diet to help, uh, hold on, to help the state and local partners accelerate the underground implementation of the nutrient and sediment reduction actions. He, he, he received his BS in Environmental Science from the University of New Hampshire in 1984 and his MS in Environmental Toxicology from the American University in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Rich. Well, unlike my uh, prior colleague, I am going to blame the weather on, on uh, Mike here. So imagine, uh, if you will, 11 o'clock on Sunday, you're on a beach on Sanibel Island in Florida. Just uh, finished up a nice vacation down there. 85 degrees, we had sun every single day. Gorgeous weather down there. Of course, as we were leaving, the thunderclouds were coming in. I said, that's a great omen. Got back to, uh, to Maryland uh, Sunday night, mm, 70s. You know, it felt like uh, spring. You could see everything spreading out. Come here last night, snow's coming. I'm thinking, <laughs> went from summer to spring to winter again. Come on, guys, jeez. Well, I'm uh, fortunate to be back here in, in Minnesota. I was actually um, up in the uh, Boundary Waters this last July. You guys have got a phenomenal, I know you got a great resource up there, but, uh, and I'm a fly fisherman, I'm a kayaker, canoeer, and it, I just, we spent seven days out there, and, and every once in a while we had to look up to see the jet contrails to remind ourselves, we are in 2010, aren't we? And then I said, the heck with it, I'm going to go on back for one of those pike out there, guys. So it's a phenomenal resource that you all have up here as well. So, unfortunately, I've got a, if your stomach starts to rumble, because I'm going to refer to it as a diet. Uh, we've been working on a, uh, you, can, you can say TMDL. Some folks refer to that as too many damn lawyers. Um, others have other words for it as well. But we refer to it in the chess because we needed to reach out to folks like yourselves. You are the engaged people. We had to reach out to 78,000 farmers. We've got 1,600 local governments across the six-state Chesapeake Bay watershed. We had to explain this in terms that people could understand. People understand clean water. They like to have their latte in the morning, like to have a clean shower, but they also need a clean Chesapeake Bay, a clean Susquehanna, a clean Chickahominy. 
because that's where they recreate, that's where their local economies could come from, that's where their drinking water comes from as well. So as we refer to it, a, a, a diet, literally a diet, that, that there, there is a human analogy, you don't want to fo poke at folks that are thinking about their diets or whatever, but the Chesapeake, the, the Mississippi, the, the Minnesota has a metabolism as well. In the case of the Chesapeake Bay, it has too much nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment pollution. We think we understand scientifically how much you, what you need to get down to. Like a diet, it's tough. It involves a lot of Oprah Winfrey. It uh, involves some counseling. It also involves a tremendous amount of science and understanding. So we wanted to try to explain to folks that this is not something that's foreign. This is not something that's bad. This is not being imposed upon you. It is for you. It is so when you turn that tap on, when you look at your local economy, when you go fishing, when you depend on that, everybody depends on clean water. So let's walk through um, what we've got there as well. As uh, my colleague before mentioned that I've been working on the Chesapeake Bay for 26 years. I wake up every morning, get out there, and, and I'm motivated because I enjoy not only the Chesapeake, but getting up in those streams and rivers that have those little fin creatures that go around there as well. Um, but it is a, it's a wonderful resource like you all have here in Minnesota and in Wisconsin. But before doing that, I, I had to put this up here because I'm going to refer to we a lot. And what, what you're looking at is not a, uh, a visual chart for those of you guys in the back that are adjusting your glasses. This is, in fact, the, what we call the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership Organization. It starts at the top. It includes governors of six states, EPA administrator, the mayor of the District of Columbia. It gets down into the technical folks down here looking at a whole host of issues. There's about 500 individuals from, from governors and mayors to scientists to uh, folks that are running wastewater treatment facilities to uh, uh, folks in, in state, local, and, and federal agencies that are involved in these areas. You can see somebody from an environmental law firm, a uh, county administrator, somebody from Penn State University. You can see Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Geological Survey. You can see the Nature Conservancy. These are our leaders. These are folks that are doing this effort out there as well. It takes literally, as I think Hillary Clinton said, a village. In this case, it takes a massive amount of folks moving towards the same approach. They may take a different tact as, as they're working along there, but they certainly do that. And also underneath there, it takes a tremendous amount of, in this case, these are our, what we call our goal implementation teams, looking at fish issues, looking at uh, stewardship, looking at healthy watersheds, looking at water quality issues, and then you'll notice underneath here, you almost have to, as you're working with an ecosystem like the Chesapeake Bay or the upper Mississippi, you have to organize yourself like that ecosystem is organized. Having that human dimension is nice, it doesn't care. It needs to understand the force and what happens on that land and how the agricultural production is going on, et cetera. So enough of that. But when I say we, it is not just EPA. It's six states. It's about 30 different federal agencies. It's about, uh, I'd say, 25 to 30 major uh, universities and colleges growing as we go. And now increasingly about 1,600 local governments that are trying to do their share and we'll describe what that is for this Bay Pollution Diet. But like you all, we, we were fortunate to have a tremendous amount of science in the Bay Region itself. I'll walk between the two of these. Unfortunately, we've got some of the same kind of problems that you all face in here. In our case, too much nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment pollution coming in from a whole host of sources, and I'll describe that. Everybody always wants to point the finger at the farmers, at the wastewater treatment plants. I say, point that finger at the back end of your SUV as well, because that's a piece of it, to its septic systems. It's every single one of those pieces. It's every single one of those 17 million people that call that mid-Atlantic region home as well. So we've got too much of that. We have some algae blooms right now. If you go to where I live in Annapolis out on the waterfront, the water is green. I mean, it's a nice shade of green that would make uh, Martha Stewart pretty happy about doing that. That doesn't belong on your walls, and, or nor does it belong on the, on, in the Chesapeake. I told a colleague, uh, wait about another month and a half and it'll, and it'll stain brown. That's harmful algae. That is not good for a particular system like we've got in the Chesapeake Bay. That algae blocks light, like you all are, are looking at here in Lake Pepin, as well as up in the upper Mississippi and up in the Minnesota itself. We have a similar issue with underwater grasses. We have about 26 different species. You don't have them. You have barren, essentially pavement on the bottom there. You do not have a healthy ecosystem. So we've got to bring those back. We have un algae that goes uneaten because who wants to eat a uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich and put a bunch of sand in there and just keep eating away. That's like what you then force an oyster to do and they'd say, wait a second here, that's not good healthy food. Or as I refer to it, imagine eating uh, McDonald's cheeseburgers and uh, McNuggets day in and day out for the next 30 or 40 years. You might be able to survive, but you're not going to look good after that and it's not going to be healthy. That's exactly what we're feeding most of our uh, critters here in the Chesapeake Bay. 
That algae dies off and then it removes the oxygen from down here as well. So what are our key pieces? Too much nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment coming into the system itself. Blocks light for the underwater grasses. That dies off uneaten, that it, that it then takes oxygen out of the water column. And then harmful algal blooms, not good food. You can explain that to folks. You don't need to go back and remember that organic chemistry in the Krebs cycle, etc. If you don't have good food, if you put your house plants in a, in a closet and shut the door for four weeks, they're not going to survive. And if, you, if we, all of us in this room, okay, if it's around May, I'd say one, two, three, take your final breath, and I'll come back in September 30th, October 1st, and say, breathe. That's what it's like in parts of the Chesapeake Bay. Absolutely no oxygen down there. That's not healthy. We know what, in fact, what we need to do, and that's one of the key things that we've done, and that is to build the TMDL on the basis of good science, and that is how much oxygen is necessary, and, it, and I'll show you in a second, it's different levels out there as well, what light do our underwater grasses need, and then what kind of good, clean, good algae, we know we need it, it's the base of the food chain, what kind of good algae out there as well. If we didn't do that, if we didn't establish very clearly so that folks in New York, folks in Richmond, folks on the eastern shore, our farming community in the Shenandoah didn't understand it, didn't agree to it, we wouldn't be there. We had to get everybody essentially to agree, not all 17 million people, but we had to get the majority of the folks out there to agree what is a clean, healthy Chesapeake Bay, a James River, a Pocomoke River, you know, you name the different streams and rivers, we had to get that agreement to then build this effort off the Why? Because we're asking local folks to, to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars, states to invest billions of dollars, farmers to reach into their pockets, local uh, landowners to reach in their pockets and say, I need to put something out there for not only for me, for my drinking water, but for my ge next generation as well. So that was one of the key pieces that we learned in there, and I think you all have done that with your, your total suspended solids site-specific criteria. But here's what the Chesapeake Bay looks like. If you're anything other than a, a light to dark blue color, that means you don't have enough oxygen in that area. You can see what we call the old drowned river of Susquehanna, that these deeper areas in there, that red area, absolutely no oxygen. That's not natural. Certainly when John Smith was discovering the Chesapeake Bay right in the 1620 time period, there was low dissolved oxygen and that was a natural part of the system, but not completely absent oxygen. So we unfortunately, every year we have large parts of our system that do not have enough oxygen for in our case, crabs, oysters, rockfish, bluefish, things that are commercially, recreationally, that, that are caught out there that are ecologically important to the system itself as well. We also have uh, what we call underwater bay grasses, similar to what you all are looking at here. What you're looking at is an, a, um, almost a 25-26-year uh, uh, record of, of underwater grasses from about 20% of a goal. We've got a goal, actually it's now built into Maryland, Virginia, D.C., and Delaware's water quality standards. We're trying to bring back about 185,000 acres of underwater grasses. We developed that actual goal not just by pulling it out of the sky, we went back, we were fortunate, we had aerophotography of the Chesapeake Bay back in the 30s, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We mapped out where the grasses had been before the system really crashed post-World War II into the 60s and 70s itself. So we were able to then map that out, build it into water quality standards. So it is a regulation. It is something that we're all, all 17 million of us need to then shoot for. Right now we went from about 35,000 acres to we're up around, uh, we just released the, ninth, the 2010 acreage around 87,000, just under halfway there to get to 185,000 acres of underwater grasses. So in this particular case, this is a measure folks can feel, you can understand it, you understand if we don't have grasses, you don't have baby crabs, you don't have baby crabs, you don't have crab cakes on your plate, there's a local economy, there's a local cuisine, there's a local heritage there as well. You don't have underwater grasses, we don't have waterfowl. That's a huge tourist piece, that's a huge hunting element to, to that. It's again, it's something that the region has as a part of its culture. So these grasses are important. But what we did is we put the science underlaying that, built it into the standards, and then to get there, we need to bring back light. People can understand that as well. One of the other things we did, and that is previously, uh, this was around in the 1980s, 1990s, we have four jurisdictions on the Chesapeake Bay. You have Maryland, Virginia, D.C. and Delaware, and I'll show you on a map uh, you know, where those already those lay out there. So if you're a rockfish coming in, um, you're coming into spawn, so you're a mother female, you got you know, eggs in, you're going to head up there, you're in Virginia, you talk with this kind of a strange accent down there, twang, you call people you know, by, by strange names, um, so that you did that, then, then you move into Maryland waters. 
from Virginia waters to Maryland waters uh, 10 years ago, you had to quickly gulp some in, in Virginia because the Maryland water quality standards for dissolved oxygen was different. Then you then moved up into, into DC waters and you're actually going to spawn in an area just below Rock Creek. You had a different standard. That rockfish saw three different jurisdictions. She didn't see any difference. She just knew that she had to get back up to, to there, put her eggs in there and get her, her children, essentially that next generation to come through in there. It made absolutely no sense. So what we got is the six governors to agree and the mayor to agree to define clean water in the Chesapeake Bay. One of the key pieces of that is to divide up the river, not according to how us humans look at it, but it was to divide up the river to the way that in fact the river told us. And that is during the springtime, you're going to normally have low dissolved oxygen down in these parts of it. Um, that's what we call places where if you're, if you're a lawyer or if you're a worm or clam, you're going to be happy down there. Are there any lawyers in the room? <laughs> Mud sucking? Oh, I'm sorry, guys. So you, lawyers like um, worms and clams, they, they only need a certain small amount of oxygen. That's great. So that Mother Nature said that's going to naturally be low. Right now we have absolutely none. We need to bring it in there. In this middle area, you sort of see where this water column is. If you jump into a lake, it, I know that you all have done that a lot, that top layer is nice and warm and you put your feet down there and you got that cold layer. We have the same thing in the Chesapeake Bay. Warmer waters, colder waters. Less salty waters, more salty waters. So there was a natural division of how we did in there. So we broke it up so that if you're down in this area, you're a crab, an oyster, or a croaker. Um, you're still bottom feeders, but we pull them up a little bit from the lawyers. Um, underwater grasses, we defined a specific place out there for, for shallow water habitats. And then in open water habitats, this would sort of be like uh, places for walleye, et cetera. Well, we had menhaden, rockfish, bluefish. Each one of them actually had different requirements. You'll notice the stipple pattern which is during the spawning season, which can run from February essentially to May time period, we actually had to have standards in place that were more sensitive. So when we had, whether it was a rockfish, we had a yellow perch, a white perch, they actually had to be protected more than the current water quality standards were. So we essentially divided up what we call sort of a local zoning map for the Chesapeake according to what the biology told us, and then we attached how much oxygen do you need for these different critters, how much light do you need for the underwater grasses, what level of good chlorophyll A is necessary for in there as well. We got essentially six states in the district and EPA and localities and others to agree that this zoning map made sense. We're not putting a Walmart one place in, in multi-family uh, homes in another place, but that was essentially what we were trying to do. We weren't trying to bring back a Chesapeake Bay in the, 19, in the 1600s. We couldn't do that. We had 17 million people. We had at any one time on the Delmarva Peninsula, we have about 750 million chickens. That's part of our economy, that's part of how we're doing it. We had to figure out what do we want to get to as a Chesapeake region, um, still able to keep uh, 17 million people and growing in that particular area at the same time restore the ecosystem. But as I mentioned, a key piece of that was then connecting up that spawning rockfish at the top to these worms and clams on the bottom. So we actually came up, it got a little complex, but it went from you know, whether you had six milligrams per liter or, or down the deep channel, one milligram per liter. Previously, it was either four or five all the way through the water column, which ignored all the science that we had out there. So I think the, the key thing that we learned is get the science right, work with your constituents out there, everyone is, as much as possible, and understand what is a clean Minnesota River, a Lake Pepin, uh, a St. Croix River, what, is it, what defines clean, get agreement to that, and then build off of that. That helped us out tremendously. You know, this was a very complex thing, w working six states in, in the District of Columbia, but we got everybody agree uh, to where we want to go from here. Another piece that's, that has really benefited us over time, and that is Monotank. Well, I'm going to show you a bunch of uh, models in a minute, but first and foremost, uh, Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. In that case, he was talking about the Soviet Union, which is no longer out there, but in this case, we can trust our tools, you know, we can predict the weather, we can use models, etc. but we want to go back and verify it. Do I see underwater grasses out there? Do I have enough oxygen for crabs and rockfish? Do I actually see good algae conditions? In this case, um, this is the Chesapeake Bay itself. Uh, just to refer to that little sort of square up there, that's Washington, D.C. Here's a piece of Virginia. When I refer to the Delmarva Peninsula, this is our section over here. There's Delaware, Maryland's over here. To the north would be Pennsylvania, even further up would be New York, and I'll show you those in a minute as well. So that we've got about 150 stations across the tidal waters, and then we've got about 80 stations right now, and I'm hoping to get some funding to bring about 120 stations throughout the six-state watershed itself, looking at 
what's the river flow out there? How much nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment are coming through? Are farmers making a difference out there? Are producers doing it? What about that local treatment plant? Did you see a, an improvement in that stream? as people are taking, putting rain barrels in place and doing things that are unique in their urban and suburban neighborhoods, are you seeing it in the rivers? And I'll show you, even such a huge watershed influenced by 17 million people, the watershed is coming back. 25 years against hurricanes and record, uh, I always ask my USGS colleagues, how can you have 300 year storms in a 20 year period? I'm thinking 100 year storms. And we've had a couple of those, we've had record droughts. The system has continued to come back. Do we have further to go? Yes. But it, in fact, can show you that you can, against a very complex system, you can see that, that signal of people are actually doing the right thing now. And here's, here's a couple graphics that show it to you. I'll walk between the two right here. First one is looking at um, nitrogen and phosphorus. This is looking at 32 stations where we have a 25-year record in place already. So essentially, a quarter century, we've been watching the pulse. In some cases, it goes back further than that. The downward arrows in green indicate significant trends over 25 years. So the mighty Susquehanna, 50% of that river flow coming in here, mainly farmers up there, mainly producers up there, what they're doing on the ground there has made a difference in the local streams and rivers, and we're seeing it in this huge thing between these 100-year storms and droughts and stuff, we can still see that signal that, in fact, it's happening. And nitrogen, same thing in phosphorus. There are some places that we're seeing some upticks. We want to understand what's happening out there for the most part. Nitrogen and phosphorus pollution are either holding steady or heading down there. We are seeing some sort of leveling out there because of we've got more people coming in here. We've done all the easy stuff. We've done the more difficult stuff. We've got to go up to that proverbial outer branch on that apple tree and sort of figure out how to pick that out as well. So that those, those are the pieces that are looking at that in here. In the case of sediment, something that you all are very interested in. Sediment is, um, you can see in the mighty Susquehanna. Um, one of the things I want to raise to you, I don't you can't see it on here. We actually have four major dams up in there. Three of them have actually gotten filled in since 1920. So in other words, they, for, for a while, we referred to them, excuse my language, the best BMP, best dam BMP that Pennsylvania could put in place. Those dams were actually catching a tremendous amount of sediment and bringing with it a lot of phosphorus and a little bit of nitrogen as well. Three of them have actually come into equilibrium. In other words, they're no longer catching sediment. And the third one, the fourth one down, excuse me, these are all hydroelectric uh, power plants, is now sort of filling up slowly but surely. So when it fills up, the Chesapeake's going to see a tremendous amount more sediment. But those power plants no longer have the capacity in their reservoirs to do what they want to do out there as well. So it impacts power generation. It impacts um, in terms of the, the quality of the Chesapeake Bay as well. But for the most part, we're seeing downward trends or, or sort of holding steady lowest 25 years, um, some upward trends as well. But that power of monitoring has been incredible. It allows us to look at models. It allows us to understand that system. And it allows us to give feedback to localities, to our producers, to, uh, to folks that are in making investments in wastewater treatment facilities, to governors, to mayors, to administrators of saying, in fact, what you've been investing in is making a difference. Not quite there yet, but you're heading in the right direction. And it gives us a sense that, in fact, we can get there as well. So let's get into this, um, this pollution diet. What I'm showing up here is, if you then took the chart, this is around 2009 time period, getting our best information. I'm going to show you a chart in terms of where the different sources are. But first, I want to show you the six states in the district. If you then looked at how much of the nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, in this case, and I'm not showing you sediment, just the interest of time, how much of that actually gets not just off the farm field, not off the, your neighbor's backyard, out of a sewage treatment plant, out of a septic system that's not working right, how much of that eventually works its way to the Chesapeake Bay is what we call a delivered load. So you'll see Pennsylvania is a winner on nitrogen, followed by Virginia and Maryland. And then in phosphorus, Virginia, Pennsylvania, um, Maryland, Virginia always says, well, it's because the glaciers put all this, this till right at our, our doorstep. And that we can res you know, blame it on those guys. I said, you guys have nothing to talk about glacier till. Head up to Minnesota and Wisconsin, then you can talk about it. But anyways, so that would be sort of, here's what the, that pie looks like. What we did not do is say, hey, listen, Pennsylvania, you're 41% of that nitrogen. You have a 41% reduction responsibility. We did not do that. Why? Because there's a better amount of science under there that convinced governors that there's a different way to slice that pie up. One that's smarter, one that's it's going to give you the best water quality, and one that's more cost effective, cost uh, efficient in there as well. And I'll show you how we got there as well. But how to get six governors degree, particularly if you're in New York, New York or Pennsylvania, you don't have any waterfront on the Chesapeake Bay. Your local streams and rivers will benefit, 
But those Marylanders, those Virginians, those folks in Delaware, folks in D.C., they'll have a direct, more direct benefit to the local economies, to, their, to the social, to the recreational, to the historic opportunities there as well. We had to convince those sort of upstream states that they had to do their share as well, and here's a, a more equitable way of doing it. Then I want to show you on the nitrogen um, slide. This one gives you just a feel for it. it. This is not trying to point a finger at any particular source out there, because we, as we said, if you're resident within the Chesapeake Bay watershed, if you're one of the 17 million people, you flushed that toilet this morning, you drove that car, you were part of the problem, and you need to be part of that solution. So you can't point to the producers, you can't point to the local wastewater treatment plant, to your neighbor's septic system, to your neighbor's SUV, because you do the same thing as well. But you'll notice a couple things here. One is, we've broken it out by, you can look at the, the contribution from our agricultural production, chemical fertilizers, manure, uh, which is, is a, an important quantity and, and uh, a resource down in the Bay Region. We produce a tremendous amount of it, not just in Washington, D.C. This is the good manure, not the kind of BS that happens in D.C., folks. Um, this is stuff that, in fact, allows crops to grow, put in there properly. And then an atmospheric component. That actually, that ag sector has shrunk over time. That, in fact, our producers have put in cover crops. They've done nutrient management efforts. I can go through, they've done grazing. They've done um, stream fencing. There's a whole host of practices that, in fact, our rivers and streams are showing that. I want to show you that information in a second. So that piece of the pie has shrunk. We have a tremendous amount of atmospheric deposition, nitrogen, nitrogen oxides that influence ozone. They influence visibility out there, acid precipitation. They also pr produce about a, almost a quarter to a third of the nitrogen coming into the Chesapeake Bay. So we not only have to thank ourselves, we actually have defined an air shed, similar to a watershed. We've defined an air shed that includes 17 states, three Canadian provinces of where the majority of that air pollution is that's eventually coming into the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So we need to clean up tailpipes and uh, power plants in order to bring back the Chesapeake Bay as well, and that's a piece of our pollution diet in here. Our wastewater treatment facilities used to be more than almost 30 percent of that whole pie, um, up there uh, getting close to what our, our farmers had uh, and our agricultural areas as well. That's now shrunk to 19 and it's continuing to go down there. The two places that are growing, and that is What's coming off of our, our urban lands out there, where folks are putting um, fertilizers on lawns, or you put another one of those wonderful Walmarts in place and you have a big uh, piece of concrete or, or asphalt out there, that atmospheric deposition comes on there, grows off there. We are not holding steady. We are, in fact, growing our, our urban suburban loads compared to our producers, which are reducing it. Our atmospheric deposition is going down, and our uh, wastewater treatment facilities are going down as well. So that piece, and the same thing with our septic systems that you can flush and stuff, but a majority of that nitrogen is going to work its way in groundwater and come back either into your own drinking water or it's going to come into local streams and rivers and it's going to affect somebody else's drinking water downstream as well. Those are tough ones to deal with, but as I'll show you as we put our pollution diet together, they are part of that, they're part of the problem and they've got a, a piece of the allocation necessary to make that happen as well. So we have, um, in the, the past two years, we had Two rounds of uh, public meetings, 18 across six states. So imagine going on a water watershed tour for six weeks, not seeing your family, going out there and talking to many, many folks out there. Um, I remember last year, we talked to probably, I think we estimated around 2,500 actual producers, about 1,000 local government officials out there, as well as others like yourself that were engaged in what we were doing there to try to understand what is the implications of this TMDL itself. And we said, you can't point the fingers and everybody, the home builders want to say, well, it's the, it's the farmers in there. Farmers want to say, it's those wastewater treatment plants, guys. We said, no, you can't do that. They said, okay, I agree with clean water, but I want to be sure that you guys are holding the, all those other guys accountable to their level that they are. That's exactly what we try to do all the way up to the governor's level. And that is not equally, but equitably divide up that responsibility and hold individuals, counties, townships, uh, conservation districts, municipalities, et cetera, accountable for their piece of that load so that they understand their upstream and their downstream neighbor as well would do that. And I'll describe that in a minute of how we went about doing that. But also that we were focused on the Chesapeake Bay and like uh, right now you may be focused on Lake Pepin and, and the Minnesota River, but there's a St. Croix up there, there's the Upper Miss, that every action, every wastewater treatment plant that's upgraded, every time a, a producer fences his cows out of the stream, does pasture management up here. He or she benefits, hopefully, their bottom line in terms of better production, but they also benefit that local stream. They're going to benefit local drinking water.
folks say, oh, where do you get your drinking water? Out of the tap. I'm sorry, it comes either from groundwater, from surface water, comes in the rain. Um, the mighty Susquehanna I showed you, I think about four or five million people drink that water. Um, they think, what do you mean, somebody flushed and came down? That's what, hap what happens, guys. Um, so we, we're getting that. We're also improving uh, recreational opportunities for these in there as well. So even though we're doing this massive TMDL, this massive pollution diet for this piece of salty water that a number of those folks may never see, may never touch, may say, hey, listen, that's not going to affect my local economy. And we're saying, yes, it is. You're, you're connected to water like any other living creature out there as well. So every action you're going to doing is going to help your local economy. It's going to help your local sources of drinking water as well as your downstream neighbor. So we were trying to say, say to the 17 million people, there is a benefit to you. You may be thinking you're putting it out there, but somebody else is also making an investment upstream that's going to benefit you as well. So here's what this bait pollution diet comes out to. It was not just one nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment number. It was actually 92 nitrogen, 92 phosphorus, and 92 sediment TMDLs. Let me get to this because this is the other connection that I wanted to make up to you all, and that is until you go local, which I'll show you how we do it, you can set all the wonderful goals, you can set the water quality standards, you can do TMDLs, you can allocate it. You're not going to get people's attention until they understand for their community, for their conservation district, for their municipality, for their facility, what is their responsibility. Here in the case of the Chesapeake Bay, let me orient you again, New York to the north there, uh, Pennsylvania, West Virginia out here, uh, West by God, Virginia, we say it. It's a beautiful piece of country as well. Virginia, where they talk strange as well. I could say that because my mom was born and raised down there. She was actually raised on a farm. My grandfather was a uh, tobacco farmer back in the Depression in years and then also raised uh, mixed vegetables and stuff like that. So she brought a, a farm ethic to the table. My father was a first-generation Ukrainian-American, so he brought a different Eastern European piece. So imagine uh, about uh, 300 years of Virginia matching with a first uh, generation Ukrainian. It was an in incredible marriage between those two folks out there and it affected the rest of us, us kids how we thought, uh, looked at the world as well. So anyways, uh, Maryland and then Delaware. Each one of these colored areas actually has its own nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment allocation. Its own pollution diet and I'm going to describe for you in a second how to do that. The important thing is those areas then match up to what's over here and that is these are 92 segments that in Clean Water Act parlance are polluted waters, impaired waters. They don't have enough oxygen, they don't have enough underwater grasses, they have too much bad algae as well out there. So essentially it's similar to what you all are saying. We don't have the right critters in there, we don't have good clear water, we have too much sediment in the water column. All those areas in the Chesapeake Bay are impaired. People go out there, they can look at the waters, you can't see your toes if you walk out to your knees. That's not clean. You don't see those underwater grasses you remembered like you saw in the 70s. You have to go fish somewhere else because there's no oxygen in that particular area. So each one of these areas actually drains right into it. The mighty Susquehanna drains into here, or the Bush River right next to it drains in there as well. So each one of those, we had to use our best science to connect up local river systems or big mighty river systems. So you might think of this as like the Upper Miss. This could be the Minnesota. This could be the St. Croix down here. Um, we did it actually at, at the river, the scale of the, the Vermilion or, or others that you all have, the smaller river systems that you got in here as well. So again, when, when, you're setting this, when we were setting this diet, we had to bring it down to the scale of the impaired waters themselves, but we had to bring it local. And that's actually only the, the first step of three that we're going to do to bring it more local, and I'll describe that in a second. So part of this process was as follows. And I'm going to, I mentioned TMDL, I have up here what, a WIP. Now that's not an EPA term, although we occasionally use it out there. Um, it's what we refer to as a watershed implementation plan. In other words, a very locally derived from conservation districts, from the states, from watershed organizations, from municipalities, a plan to then say, how are we going to get to our piece of that 92 um, segment uh, pollution diet? So the process that we went through, we've actually been essentially working towards this for the last 26 years, building the science, building the monitoring, the understanding. We actually had agreements among the states that were voluntary agreements at the governor's level. We sort of did, I would refer to them as two practice runs did the division up the responsibility, but not at the scale that we're talking about here. So this wasn't all of a sudden, one day we decided, hey, we want to do a TMDL. We were under a court order deadline uh, from 1998 to get a TMDL done for Maryland and Virginia waters, but we then said, hey, listen, let's do it all at the same time, bring in all six states in the district to work together. So essentially the, the sort of sequence that we did, and I'll show you in a couple of slides here, 
that we first got agreement way back in, in 2000 time period at the governor's level, what is a clean Chesapeake Bay? A clean Potomac River, a clean Chop Tank River, a clean Pianca Tank River. Those were those standards for dissolved oxygen, water clarity, underwater grasses, and coral fillet. So that built a solid foundation. We also said, where are the rockfish habitats? Where are the crab food habitats out there? Where do we want to bring back underwater grasses? That was our designated uses, our local zoning. That all underlaid what we had here. Then, as I'll show you, we used a series of models to get to where we are as well. So then we said, agreed to all those major river basins, sort of at the scale you all are looking at, the St. Croix, the, the, uh, the Minnesota, the Mississippi, the, the metro area around Lake Pepin. Here's what the, we agreed to in terms of the overall diet for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. We went through one round of, um, two, actually two rounds of public meetings, one that we had previously, then we, we took the actual Bay TMDL out um, through a, a public process as well. Then we then work with the states themselves to then say, okay, here's what we think your, your, your draft nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment pollution diet numbers are. Let's go back and work with you all and say, what, what is the capacity of your local programs, your municipalities, your conservation districts, your stormwater uh, utilities to actually deliver at these particular levels? What's missing in there at the state, federal, and local scale in terms of funding? Boots on the ground out there to work with our producers. What do you need? What do you have currently? what capacity do you think you have in the future and what are you missing so that we can explain to governors, to congressmen, to, uh, to, to delegates at the state level of what's going on there as well. We agreed to that. Then we went in there and, and uh, put out nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment allocations. Went out for another round of public review, in this case with the actual draft TMDL, a 45-day um, public comment period, a six-week uh, engagement of, of, as I said, 18 public meetings across the six states, around 50 meetings of stakeholders, again, home builders. We sat down with environmental advocacy groups. We sat down with local elected officials. We sat down with producers. We sat down with conservation districts and others out there. Then wrapped it up at the end of December, published a TMDL, and then jumped into what we call the phase two piece, and that is taking those 92 and now going down, as I'll show you in a minute, down to the county scale, the municipality, the small watershed. So we didn't think it was enough to then take that Chesapeake Bay watershed and divide it up into the 92, what we call the segment sheds, those areas that are draining into those impaired waters. We wanted to get down to the scale at which local zoning decisions are made, where, where folks are working with the producers, where they're working with individual treatment plants, where they're working with uh, regulated stormwater areas out there, where people were making decisions that were going to influence the land and what was going to be happening out there as well. We're doing that one. And then we'll, we're starting, as I'll describe in a second, a process of every two years, all six governors, the APA administrator, and the federal agencies report to the public of saying, here's what we've done in the last two years. Did we make our mark? If not, EPA can take some federal actions. If so, what's the next two years? How are we going to move forward with that? And I'll describe that in a second. Doing towards two things, and that is we love humans. All of us humans, we're, we're tend to be optimistic for the most part. There may be a couple pessimistic folks in here that we said, hey, listen, guys, we've got to, as we head towards it, the governor's agreed to getting the job done, getting all the practices in place by 2025. What was agreed to as well is by 2017, half of the way there towards 2025, we expected to get 60%, not 50% of the practices, upgraded treatment plants, as I refer to as cows diapered, stream, streams restored out there, getting 60% of those actions in place by 2017, and then the hard stuff in that next uh, seven years out there as well. Uh, then to move it. So then we're looking towards doing this phase two in 2011, 2012, getting down to the county scale, the municipality, the conservation district level, 2017, saying, are we 60% of the way there? If not, we've got to readjust things and then head towards 2025. So that was the, the process that we had laid out there and got agreement to. The reason we did three phases is we said we didn't have the time, the, uh, the full amount of science, and we needed to give opportunity, not for all 17 million people, but for thousands and thousands and thousands of local governments, producers, county officials, um, municipalities, et cetera, to be engaged in this process as well. One of the things that we did use, and I'm going to show you on the next slide, is a series of models to essentially do a series of things, and that is take a tremendous amount of information. Over the last 25 years, we've been trying to account the best as we can to what cover crops have been put in place. What have our producers done in terms of uh, changing the feed uh, mixture for, for our poultry industry out there? What upgrades of wastewater treatment plants have occurred? What municipalities have actually gone forward and put very innovative stormwater efforts in place? What kind of legislation has been put in place to ban, for example, more recently, phosphorus and, and um, commercial fertilizers? 
How do, how do we capture all that data where the humans are located, where the cows and chicks are located? What's coming in from the air in terms of air deposition? What are our changes in land use? We've went from 8 million people in 1950 to 17 million people in 2025. We've doubled our population in a lifetime of some of our residents out there. And about every uh, decade or so, we're bringing another million people into the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We need to understand what that, that change was, draw all that information together, and use a series of models to then say, what if? What if we did nothing on the land? What would happen 20 years from now? What was it like during sort of, uh, we call um, you know, pre-European context, 1600s, when it was 100, maybe about 90% forested watershed out there? What it would it look like? What if we did everything humanly possible? Cost be damned, put everything aside. What would be possible out there? What kind of water quality conditions? Then realistically, what track are the states and the, and the localities on, what that might look like as well? Ask a series of these what-if questions, and essentially, eventually went up to state secretaries, went up to governors and said, here's what we think is possible out there. But a key in ingredient that was these things called models. In some cases of our, for example, our watershed model, think of it as it's a huge accounting system. Where are the located, where are the people located? What are the land uses out there? What uh, amount of fertilizer are people applying in their backyards? Or on their soybean, corn, winter rye rotation out there? Where, where do people, have they made some changes in terms of the landscape of planted forests as opposed to uh, meadows out there? That this model is actually in its fifth generation. It has fingerprints from uh, our land-grant universities. We have about 10 of them across the Chesapeake Bay watershed. That in fact, we wanted to bring the best available science in there. They are still that trust but verify. Use them. They're tools, but they are tools to help your decision making. But we will go back and monitor. Is that trout stream back? Can you see your toes in the Chesapeake Bay? Do you have oxygen? For crabs way down there. That's how we would eventually do it. We were fortunate to have built up, as I said, the fourth generation, fourth generation, uh, third generation, and fifth generation of our water quality sediment transport model. So it allowed us to then say where the air pollution is coming from, can be from the Ohio River Basin and, or from our own backyards, where that deposition is occurring. Um, this is the Chesapeake Bay broken up to about a thousand segments. So below the county scale, we know that we, and some information we only have the county scale, et cetera. So we used the best available information, but we knew we wanted to get down to have confidence at that county, that conservation district, that large municipality. Essentially, uh, for you, those of you that think in terms of hydrologic unit codes, something around the 12 to 13 huck unit is what we're trying to drive towards to get down there. These models are calibrated, for example, the watershed model, over 25 years worth of data. And that includes those 600 year storms and droughts that we saw in there as well. Good years, bad years, et cetera, at about 150 to 200 stations across that watershed. So we had confidence because we've been, we looked over the decadal scale. We also had a land change model that our U.S. Geological Survey colleagues did, looking back at the last 30, 40 years, and then looking at economic times. So it's, that sort of took a turn in the last couple of years, and we said, gosh, we've got to go back and rethink that one um, in terms of looking out 30 years in terms of projections. And then a model of essentially the estuary. This brings in the salt, this brings in waves and currents, but it also allowed us to then say how much oxygen how much uh, algae is out there, what amount of underwater grasses come back if we do smart things on our tailpipes, if in fact we reduce uh, wastewater coming, I mean, nitrogen phosphorus coming out of our wastewater treatment plants. We do smart growth, we, we learn to figure out how to go into our inner cities, into our townships, et cetera, better. What kind of water quality conditions do? So it allowed six states, it allowed federal governments, it allowed local, local governments to ask a collective of what if what if we did the following? What if we took different policies? What if we did, looked at funding? What if we, in fact, um, tried a different approach out there? We ran literally hundreds of scenarios working with our states and localities to, to date to come up with this base pollution diet itself. And part of that came down to, first and foremost, what do I need to do on the land in order to bring back dissolved oxygen, good water clarity, underwater grasses, good algae? And this, this chart shows you just a, a um, about uh, maybe about 10 of the, the 100 or so runs that we did using our Bay Water Quality Model. What this allows is saying, under 1985 conditions, uh, what these three lines are saying in the open water, sort of in the, thinking up in terms of here, the walleye habitat versus uh, our uh, crab habitat versus down in the deep area where the, uh, the lawyers are going to be lurking down in there. How many of those segments actually did not have enough oxygen to, to survive out there? And then as we then said, okay, that's 1985 conditions, what is the current conditions? We can look at our monitoring data, but we allowed our model to then tell us, yeah, we made some progress. And then 
We set goals with the governors back in 2000 under a voluntary agreement. What would that have gotten us there? Got us a long ways there, but it didn't quite get us there. To, to the, what if um, we went back pre-European uh, contact to the 1600s? What amount of dissolved oxygen would be there? And yes, the standards, these revised standards that I mentioned would be in, in case. So we went through a whole series of these, as I said, working up to the, the, uh, the six states and uh, to, the, to the state secretary level. And imagine sitting with secretaries from ag, transportation, natural resources, pollution agencies around tables about, every, about a quarter, I mean, every, every three or four months over a two-year period in, in explaining model output, laying out the facts and figures to them, describing how you did that. It was a phenomenal process. Our social scientists were just saying, gosh, we want to watch the behavior of the people. And our, our other scientists were saying, okay, guys, what do we have the right information to them? So what we ended up agreeing to is, here's the loading level across the Chesapeake Bay from around 350 million of nitrogen to 190, from about 19 million pounds to 12 million pounds of phosphorus would get us there. But that was only a basin-wide, all six states. Here's what the number would be in order to meet dissolved oxygen water quality standards. We did the same thing for sediment for underwater grasses, the, the same thing for chlorophyll A as well, but I won't show you that in the interest of time. But one of the key things is, how do you get from that 190 and 12.7 million pounds to then divide it up by the different jurisdictions? This is the, the, the key set of information allowed us to do that, and that is, how do you get these six states and these six governors and the mayor to agree to it? So what you're seeing here is, in the red area, um, and then uh, it's going to say on your left, nitrogen, and then phosphorus. That red area says pound for pound, what comes out of a back end of a cow, out of a tailpipe, out of a wastewater treatment facility, out of a uh, not functioning uh, septic system. Pound for pound, it has the most influence on dissolved oxygen in your downstream neighbors. In other words, in this area in the Chesapeake Bay, the areas in red um, and, and sort of the orange color have a pound for pound the most influence on it. What you're seeing is the mighty Susquehanna, up in Pennsylvania, New York, they don't have a piece of waterfront, but pound for pound, they have a huge influence. Why? As a real estate agent would tell you, location, location, location. One is, they have a, the, the Susquehanna, um, big river system, as I said, 50% of the flow dumps that, that nitrogen and phosphorus pollution right here at the head of tide, and that has a influ direct influence down in here. Versus down in the James, um, down in here, it's not a blue state, folks, in a red state. This is saying blue, saying pound for pound does not have an influence on shear water quality. Somebody said, hey, listen, guys down in Virginia are going to get scot free off. They don't have to do much. The James is not, yes, they do. This is a measure of James influence on shared water quality. Mother Nature does, she brings in because of how the earth turns, the, the ocean, ocean waters come up the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay and come down the western shore. So that as they're coming down there, they're taking the James and they're nicely just uh, providing it to their neighbors to the south. So if you're in North Carolina, you're getting a lot of James water quality conditions out there. So in some place, we're all downstream of each other out there. But the, the James River actually has a lot of pollution problems and there's some big harmful algal blooms that are influencing their oyster and crab harvest down here. So they had to do their own, they had to clean up their own backyard for themselves because they're influencing out there. But the Susquehanna, the folks on the Eastern Shore and the Potomac, here's um, West Virginia, for example, they don't have to do as much as folks here in Maryland because they're further away and their loads get naturally sort of removed as it works through the Potomac first it comes in here as well. And the on the phosphorus side, it looks a little different. It looks like, look at, look at how, what a good job that Pennsylvania and New York are doing. This is those dams I described. That last dam is still catching a tremendous amount of that phosphorus pollution, so it's not getting into the Chesapeake Bay. So right now they get a break. But as those dams fill up and that extra phosphorus, phosphorus comes in here, they're going to either have to remove it from behind the dams or figure out somewhere on the land out of their wastewater treatment plants and something to get this work. So essentially what we did is we took the information and as I said, we went up to the state secretary level and said this is science-based. No policy so far, folks. Policy comes in in a second. This is, our science is indicating pound for pound, nitrogen, phosphorus. Here's who's influencing at these thousands of uh, little segments out there. So we used our model to get down there, not to look at just the, the lake the uh, Minnesota River as a whole, we went in there like in here and dissected it like the mighty Susquehanna, that dissected it down to smaller and smaller areas so we could understand how that, uh, the responsibility could be allocated. So we took that information, simplified it, to then say the, major, the 30 major river basins divided by states, so the eastern shore of Maryland, for example, was one of the higher ones out there that was in one of the red areas, <coughs> to uh, Pennsylvania here, 
to sort of at the midpoint are New York Susquehanna colleagues and then way out here West Virginia on the James itself. So each one of these was taking that information and saying pound for pound here's what their influence is out there. This allowed us to then define equity, equity among the six states in the district so that we got a political agreement. Here's where we go from the science to then to the policy side and that is they agreed to Here's an equitable way of dividing up the responsibility in order to get down there. Because we agreed we have water quality standards violations in Maryland, Virginia, D.C., and Delaware, we need to divide that effort up so that folks could say, here's my responsibility for doing that. The other thing we did, too, and I don't want to get too much into this, but I want to give you a little feel for it as well, another policy piece, and that is, you know that all those bars that I showed you, each one of those 31s, on either the blue bar or the red bar, and I'll explain those in a second, each one of those major river basins by state is our listed out there. From the least effective polluter, in other words, pound for pound, West Virginia saying the James has the least influence, to way out here, which would be Maryland Eastern Shore that had the most influence. What the two lines are essentially is the top one being wastewater treatment plants. What you're looking at is a scale from doing nothing to doing 100% of everything that's possible out there without relationship to cost. So we wanted to try to then say on a relative scale, we'd match up every single basin and, and what their responsibility was from doing nothing to doing absolutely everything. We then split out the wastewater treatment facilities and then all of our other um, non-point sources and some of the regulated stormwater and then made the split. What this allowed us to do is to take, um, take all that, in, that science information and then allow policy decisions to be made. How much difference between the most, uh, most polluting basin to the least polluting basin What's going to be the, that, that slope of that line? In other words, a deeper slope, you're going to ask more from those guys that have more of an influence versus the people that have less of it. Um, a shallow slope will mean that everybody's going to do a more equal effort. By splitting out the wastewater treatment facilities, we allowed ourselves to then look at, these guys have already done a tremendous amount. How do we build that in there as well? So again, I don't want to go into detail, of it, but we essentially got state um, secretaries to agree to, how do you take the science and then how do you build it into a policy so that eventually you can say, here's New York's Susquehanna, Virginia's James, Delaware's um, Upper Eastern Shore, Maryland's portion of the Potomac, and agree that, that number is an equitable definition of what they need to do, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, uh, in terms of a load reduction in order to get there. Then I'm going to then say, how do we translate that into actual practices? So that's what we agreed to for, for nitrogen, and here's a similar chart for phosphorus. But here's what it, how it came out to in terms of on a, on a basin-wide set of numbers, and that is, these are, this is model output with monitoring data coming from our wastewater treatment facilities. This is essentially capturing all the practices in neighborhoods, wastewater treatment plant upgrades, all the practices that BMP conservation practices our producers put in place, and our best estimate of under an average 10-year rainfall, here's how much the Chesapeake Bay saved, in this case for nitrogen. 1985 is sort of our base year that we're working off of. Note for agriculture, our best estimate is around 161 million pounds of nitrogen coming off the farm fields, going through the local streams and rivers into the Chesapeake Bay. Our best estimate in 2009, we just had the 2010 numbers come out, almost 50 million pounds reduction because of cover crops, because of phytase as an enzyme in, in our poultry industry. I could name 20, 30, 40 different practices that our producers are. We think that, trust some of the numbers, but verify them. As I showed you on the charts, nitrogen in the streams over the 25-year period going down. They're matching very closely what our model results are. Not perfectly. Um, model is still the best estimate in drawing that science together. But this tells us, hey, same thing for our wastewater treatment facilities, almost 40 million pounds reduction. This is at the point where it gets delivered to the Chesapeake Bay itself. You'll notice that uh, area in septics, um, in the area in... in um, gray going, going down a little bit over time as well, but against the, that human population piece. The other piece is one of the things that we emphasize that our tributary strategies are local driven plans that were still under a voluntary effort. They got us about 191 millions of pounds. The TMDL was asking about 186 millions of pounds. So we're saying, guys, in the last 10 years, under a voluntary effort, we were actually targeting about what we needed under, under TMDL. The difference between the two, I'll describe it in a second, and that is, this has got some teeth to it. This was still a voluntary, whether it's a wastewater treatment plant, whether it's a, uh, working with a farmer, whether it's a working municipality, that was the difference between the two. But the level of effort, our science has been pretty solid of saying what we need to do. You'll notice that to get there, we've taken more out of the wastewater treatment plants. We're asking more from our farmers. Um, 
We're ask, uh, asking less out of our septic systems because we don't think we can get there as well. So we try to learn over time. So that's what the, the picture for nitrogen looked like. Here's what phosphorus. You'll see a big jump between 1985 to our estimates for 2009. Farmers taking, uh, taking that down a tremendous amount. Wastewater treatment plants, secondary treatment plant, um, advanced treatment plant uh, technologies took a tremendous amount of phosphorus out of there. Because uh, as you'll notice, going to the tributary strategy, there was not a lot more reductions in there. To the TMDL, they're looking for more. Then also from our producers, we're looking for more into the TMDL allocation as well. But our science indicated between about 10 years ago to where we are now, we had better understanding in the case of the Chesapeake Bay region, we've saturated our soils and our agriculture areas. In other words, there are parts of the eastern shore, if we didn't put any more phosphorus down, we'd still have enough to support yields for the next 10, 15 years or so. So our better science indicated we had more to do on the phosphorus side um, than our science did about 10 previous years. But clearly, heading in the right direction, a lot of the easy to the hard to the more difficult stuff had already been done. That jump to the TMDL is a huge push because it's no longer, you've done, you've asked a lot of, from your 78,000 mainly family farms out there, have taken a lot of your 483 significant facilities in terms of wastewater down pretty far. You're starting to squeeze it um, to get there. Do we think we can get there? Yes. And I'll show you why as we um, work with our states to put these plans together. And then that's the same thing for phosphor, I mean for sediment. You'll notice um, that we have downward trends built into our agriculture. What I didn't get my folks to do is to break out. This is not all coming from our ag streams. This is a lot what's in our local stream banks. Um, it's in our, in our floodplains. We just uh, should not have done this. We should have made that breaking out as well. That's a tremendous amount. So our um, producers have done a tremendous amount of cover crops, conservation tillage. We're increasingly going to no-till. That's really grabbed a hold of in New York and down in Virginia of our farmers actually not tilling out in, that, in those farms and still getting good yields as well. That's factored into where we've got here as well, where we want to go from here. So what we ended up with is a pollution diet by the major river basins, essentially what you all have in, in your um, metro uh, upper Mississippi TMDL for the total suspended solids, something for the upper Miss, for the St. Croix, for the, for the uh, Minnesota, for the uh, the portion around the metro area down to Lake Pepin. And this is for our nine or 10 major river basins for the James, for the Potomac, for the Susquehanna, Eastern Shore, Western Shore, Eastern Shore, uh, James, I mean the Rappahannock and the, um, the York River. But we also then broke it up by Maryland, Virginia, DC, Delaware, New York, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. We had to put that human breakdown as well. That's where the EPA colleague stepped back and said, states, you take this down to those 92 segments that I described earlier down to those 92 watersheds that each lead into one of the impaired waters. So um, Virginia then took it and broke it down into their 38 uh, segment sheds. Maryland actually has 54. If you see a lot of these colored areas here, they had to break it down at the sub-county scale to then match it up here. Talk about somebody really engaging at. So if you're in Queen Anne's County on the Eastern Shore, you actually ended up having about four different TMDL numbers for your county that all combined together, that's what you're gonna challenge yourself with your wastewater treatment plants, with your stormwater efforts, et cetera. And here's what ended up in the TMDL. And if you're uh, bored tonight um, and you want to do it, I'll show you the website. You can download literally hundreds and hundreds of pages of this, as well as the appendices. Uh, if you're a whiz at spreadsheets, you can go down there and look at, what about that treatment plant that I heard about? You can find out it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment loads. I know some of you guys are a little insomniacs. This will put you to sleep real quickly. But seriously, for, for example, one of the little pieces up here on the upper Patuxent, for that one segment, here's what you have. The regulated, non-regulated ag, that's CAFO and non-CAFOs. Here's the wastewater treatment facilities. Here's the breakout of urban, suburban, forest. So that for that one piece, we had a tremendous amount of things already sources, not just a single number for the upper Patuxent, but broken down by the sources already. That is the way you, ha uh, you get attention. That is the way you get implementation by assigning it at the local scale, but with the, com the confidence that you have as well and then it goes on from there as well. But we figured that was not enough. Because one of the key things that was driving it here, we, uh, EPA is an agency and, and states working with states have, uh, have developed and agreed to over, I think, 48,000 TMDLs across the country. A lot of those haven't been implemented other than for wastewater treatment facilities because it's tough to get at those non-point sources as well. We wanted to then try to say, how do we build more reasonable assurance to tell Maryland, Virginia, Penn, um, Delaware, DC that in fact you're going to get 
that implementation place. One of the places that we did it is part of what we call our phase two, and that is we weren't satisfied just going down to these 92. We wanted to get it down to the county, to the conservation district, to the planning district commission, to the small watershed scale. So here what you see is those 92 segments overlaid with, I think we've got uh, about 400 counties across the six states. If you're up in Pennsylvania, you have these things called townships and boroughs. They're these little pieces and they actually make the local land use decisions, not counties like they do in, in uh, Maryland or in, Pens in Virginia. I'm not sure how they make local planning decisions down there. They still, they still think it's war of northern aggression down there occasionally. And it's uh, sort of every man and woman for themselves down there. There are no Virginians here, are there? We love them. So that breaking it down by that, then you end up with taking these TMDLs for these 92 oh, to almost 400 nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment diets that Dolphin County, Lancaster County, my county here, Anne Arundel, knows what its responsibility is. Or it could be the colonial um, uh, district, uh, and I'll show you in a second down here, that's the, um, the Soil and Water Conservation District. So they understand what they need to work with their producers, work with municipalities on stormwater as well. <laughs> Let me give you an example of what um, Virginia looks like. So as I said, Virginia's got actually, you see on the, uh, the left-hand side there, that's their 34 Bay TMDL segments that you got to work off of. On top of this, uh, if you could see this closely, you have what they call um, planning district commission. So this is where their approach of trying to look at regional planning. Then uh, overlaid on that, you also have conservation districts and then you have individual counties. They're looking right now at what's the best scale at which to connect up to the locals. Is it the planning district? Is it the conservation district? Or is it the county? Well, what they're thinking of is actually breaking it up by conservation districts, you get the ag piece. Planning districts, you get the stormwater piece. Municipalities, you might get the wastewater piece. So they're going to try to break it up by the, the, the localities that make the most sense for them. We're not saying EPA hasn't said, here's exactly how to do it, because Pennsylvania is going to take a different approach. We wanted the localities at the right scale that, where the decisions are made that are in, enforcing that to then have that scale match up with, with where those decisions on land use, on working with producers, on working with stormwater, on working with the different sources that are, that are um, contributing to the problems out here. Then in finishing up here, here's another piece that made a, made a difference to what we're talking about there, and that is we could go at TMDL. We had the science, we had the politics agreement to take that basin-wide number, divide it up by the six states, further divide it up by the major rivers, further divide it up by those 92 segments as well. And we could have stopped there. And we'd have this nice, wonderful catalog with great science that had a heck of a lot of numbers in there, but said nothing about how are you going to get it done? How are you going to get the boots on the field? How are you going to get that long-term loan to a, a local municipality so they could upgrade their treatment plant, which is failing right now, and it's influencing their local streams and rivers, therefore their local economy, and then influencing somebody downstream? How are you going to get some expensive retrofits in an already built-up city environment like the Twin Cities? How are you going to build that in there and have folks say they've got the responsibility for doing that? Here's the process that we went through. First and foremost, look at your, as I said earlier, look at your current program capacity. What ability do you have? How many state folks do you have out there? What capacity do you have at the county scale? What about NGOs? What about others that are unique now that we have in our sort of our infrastructure to reach out to our producers, to reach out to, to homeowners, to, to work with municipalities? What is going to be necessary to fully do that? Identify the gaps. In other words, get your governor involved and said, Governor, he or she needs to be aware that we do not have the capacity to get there what we need to. We don't have the funding level. We don't have that, the capacity at the local scale. We need to bring in our mayors and our town council folks to look at that as well. Lay out a strategy from where we are now in 2011 to getting 60% of the way there by 2017 to get 100% of the way by 2025. We said, you can't plan out 15 years. Economies are going to be changing. Things are going to be doing new technologies. But we want to start to lay that out there. And every two years, states, D.C., federal government, you have an opportunity to go back, modify that plan, learn from it, commit to another two-year process through these two-year milestones. The catch is, if you fall short for 25 years of the partnership, what did you get? You might have gotten a Washington Post front page article. That's pretty embarrassing. Um, but that was it. There was no consequence, no action, no other than a, a public saying, oh, God, here those bureaucrats do it again. Um, we're saying, folks, that day is over. That, in fact, if you miss that mark, as I'll describe in a second, there are consequences. There are federal actions, EPA saying under the Clean Water Act, to keep us moving, um, to make that happen as well. And some folks said, what are you doing that? What, what, that's unfair and stuff. We'd say, guys, 
Clean Water Act was signed, what, in 72? And here we are in 2011 and we still have 95% of the Chesapeake Bay that's impaired. That's not good for my daughter's generation and others as well out there. And then to continue to monitor and model it. And then as I said, insufficient actions, the federal piece as well. That's what the difference was. And that is asking for this, asking for a level of implementation, laying that out there, not committing to everything right now, using that two year process, but every two years you gotta be held accountable. You can change your, your plans, you can adapt over time, but you gotta make your mark to getting towards that 60%. If not, Uncle Sam said, You've got, um, you got to perhaps uh, look at some, some federal actions in here. Part of that <clears throat> process is to increase our level of oversight, not trying to say get in the ways of the states, but saying, guys, part of leveling the playing field is to say, folks that are doing good, rewarding that, folks that are falling behind, giving a, a poke. It could be a blunt stick, it could be a potent, pointed stick, but that's really left up to the states of how we want to do it. So part of what we worked out with our state partners is enhanced oversight for our permitting facilities. We've got over 483 major municipal and industrial facilities. We've got about 3,000 smaller guys. We're going to be collectively looking at that a lot more, making that information a lot more public. Enhanced oversight for more selected areas where Virginia failed to say how they're going to implement their urban stormwater program. Other states did. They did not provide that accountability. We're saying, guys, you're on our watch list. You can continue to do that, but we're going to put extra pressure on you. We're going to watch you carefully because you didn't convince your other partners nor your community that you can get there. Same thing with uh, agriculture in Pennsylvania or wastewater and stormwater in, in West Virginia. And then we also took some actions that were not very popular um, but did get the attention of the states. In other words, in September of 2010, states put forth their, their, their draft watershed implementation plan. So these were saying, how am I going to get to my share of that TMDL piece? EPA looked at them and said, did you provide your downstream neighbors, did you provide the general public with reasonable assurance that you can get these plans in place? Not saying you're going to say every action you're going to take for the next 15 years. In cases, and the majority of the six states in the district failed to do so. They said, EPA, you're not going to do anything. You're going to do it like your other 48,000 TMDLs, stamp it, move it forward, put it on the shelf and move forward. No. What we did in a lot of cases is said, you failed to show how to do that. We're actually going to change your allocation. You said you want to balance it between this amount for wastewater, this amount for your ag, this amount in your urban stormwater. We said we're going to then tighten up on, we're going to regulate your portion of ag that's more regulated. We're going to ask for more there. We're going to tighten up the re requirements on your wastewater side. For your urban stormwater, we're actually going to span, expand the area that was regulated and not there. You should hear the, her, the outcry from, from congressmen, from governors and others. We said, folks, we've been saying for the last two years, it's going to be this different this time. The public has been patient, maybe not patient, for 25 years. We've got to take it seriously. The final plans, we only ended up with what we call these backstops, where we actually changed what the state said they want to do for New York wastewater, Pennsylvania urban stormwater, and West Virginia ag. We turned 180 degrees from, excuse my language, but half jackass plans to ones that said, here's actually how we're going to get the funding. Here's what we're going to do to your milestones. We took you seriously. It's amazing that within a two or three month period that you can all of a sudden have a change of heart. We got the attention of governors that were saying, you know, Republican and Democrat of saying, guys, you got to do something different here as well. It wasn't trying to be an onerous process. It was saying, read the Clean Water Act, take a look what it's asking for, what you're committing to the public, and let's figure out how to do this. Now what we're doing is taking this process, going to local scale and saying, local partners, come on board, let's figure out how we're going to do this as well. Not trying to wave some big stick around it, but saying, we've got to figure out in the next 15 years, you made a tremendous amount of progress to now, we got to finish out the game and hold it because 10 years from now, we're going to have another 1.1 million people in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and they're going to come because of the beautiful area, the economy, the local, the kind of resources that you all have out here as well. We've got to figure out how to do that. So I had to add a little bit more humor in here, and this is uh, the teacher talking and says, well, Timmy, looks like you've earned yourself 10 minutes in the cage with Mr. Whiskers. So we had to you know, remind folks that it's a different day out there, guys. That for years, yeah, you might have said, oh, you got that permit wrong, uh, you know, we'll put a fine on you and stuff. We said, no, folks, we've got to figure out how to turn this effort around. Why? Because we, EPA, the federal partners, the six states, the district, our 1,600 local governments, we've got to force ourselves to make some pretty tough choices. Not saying whether I'm going to feed my kids, put them in school or whatever. This is talking about clean water. This is something central to local economies. It comes out of the faucets, not from some magical place. It comes from the Susquehanna. 
It comes from that James uh, watershed. It comes from the ground on the eastern shore. Uh, but it also comes back in my neighborhood to the point where I could take my water and water my lawn and I would actually be violating my local code for how much fertilizer I'm putting on there. I have to treat it to the point where I should be able to take nitrogen out of there. That is just plain not right, folks. Um, but that's what we have to do because of what we've got out there as well. So Mr. Whiskers has um, sort of bared his teeth a little bit, but I think folks understood we need to do something different. For your insomniacs, that you want to download the, the Baytee MDL, I actually, I, I say that in jest, but there's a tremendous amount of information here. That again, all the science, all the information that wins in here, this is um, www.epa.gov forward slash Chesapeake Bay, one word, TMDL. Tremendous amount of, not just the TMDL document itself, but literally there's connections to hundreds of supporting scientific policy, all the other documents that went really in the last 25, 30 years that built up the basis for what we put into the TMDL itself. So that information is all accessible out there that you can have as well. And then finishing up, if we have any time here, Mike, um, but I want to put this slide up here, not just one of those pretty pictures, but to illustrate what we're trying to do here. And that is, I know you guys are struggling with, uh, with your agriculture. Agriculture is an important part of local economies, the regional economy in the Chesapeake Bay. One of the reasons I came to work in the Chesapeake Bay is to keep these guys working lands and to keep what we call our commercial fishermen, our watermen working as well. Work in the lands, work in the waters, and still be able to do that. Now these guys are up in a, in a farm field in Car Cortland County. Two, two uh, tints of wire there, there's a stream out here, they're doing rotational grazing on that farm. That has got some of the most productive alfalfa, et cetera, in there. They showed how they, they moved their, uh, their herd around about every two to three weeks out there, worked it around there. They've got better milk production, they're now turning to organic. You can, in fact, make that happen. Same thing on, on um, our tillage crops down in here. Oh, let's drop that. The mic. Tillage crops down in here. To keep our watermen uh, working, these are guys that bring crabs and, and rockfish and oysters and, and um, other delectable things, being a seafood eater like they enjoy. For that next generation as well, I have not caught one this big, but this is what we call a rockfish. Uh, match it up to your walleye any day. Okay, okay, so a muskie will get about close to that, but there's nothing like catching one of those things. The other thing is, we've watched some of our urban centers, the Elizabeth River, the Norfolk, Hampton Roads area, Washington, D.C., Baltimore. They've turned urban blighted waterfronts that are both in terms of uh, on the land, but also in the water. We watched we watch the folks around the Norfolk area, Elizabeth River. Here's a place that had creosote, that had, uh, a lot, has a naval base Norfolk in there as well. They have actually turned that river system around, um, not to the point where you can eat things out of it, but there's oysters growing in that system now. They've turned it into a, into a waterfront like that that people enjoy looking at. They go, they're trying to get swimming in there, et cetera. They turn that economy in there. Does that help the Chesapeake Bay? Yes, but did that turn that whole, um, Norfolk Hampton Roads area around as well. They've got some more ways to go. That's what we're looking for as well. And to keep some of that open space that uh, we enjoy, that you all enjoy up here as well. Thank you very much for uh, listening and to uh, the poor quality jokes and the, uh, the last 25 years of history. But if you have the right science, if you work the politics in there, if you in fact define equitably in ways that people can understand, that you can explain to your neighbors, um, that you can grab a hold of it, you can in fact convince folks to do it. Talking to thousands and thousands of folks over the last year with those 18 public meetings, 50 stakeholder meetings, and all other pieces as well, not one farmer, not one home, home builder out there, not one local government, not one uh, um, uh, environmental advocate, nobody disagreed with clean water. I remember in a, we had an evening forum with about 450 mainly uh, poultry producers in the Shenandoah Valley Talk about going up to this on the stage and saying, I'm from the federal government and I'm here to help you. Dead silence. I said, guys, can you take a joke? We ended up at a, it was a two, scheduled two hour meeting. We ended up there for four hours talking to those folks. These were guys that had come off the fields and saying, I'm concerned, I'm upset and whatever. We stayed there until the last one got out of there. Were they satisfied? No. But they know that Muddy Creek, that the West Branch of the, the uh, Shenandoah, those were important to local economies. That you in fact can do that. Are we there yet? No. We've got a long history in doing it, but if you take all those measures in place, you get people a seat at the table, you work it through, but you keep them going. And in some cases, your uh, agency folks bring out a stick and say, guys, we've got to prod ourselves along. You can, in fact, make it happen. We'll come back in 2025. I'll be retired by then. I'll be having at least two more trips to the uh, Boundary Waters. I've got to get back up there again, guys. Um, and we'll see if it's happened. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you to stay up here? Sure.
did skip in and talking through the break, but uh, we're very flexible. And, and both. A couple things uh, real quick. I'm going to take, take questions now. He'll also be uh, available later. But go ahead and uh, grab something to eat. We've got some hands over here already. Um, eat this up because we are going to serve you lunch today. So let's get this breakfast stuff out. I'm starting that. How are you funding all of this? We have these things called um, the um, reserve banks, and we go there quietly at night and take another uh, withdrawal. Excellent question. It's like any other piece. Um, there's certainly federal funding involved. One of the things that, that we've done is to try to, like all of us, try to, to make a unique name for ourselves, whether you're Lake Pepin or you're a Puget Sound or your phone's going off and it shouldn't be going off, um, that... We we try to make a niche for yourself. So at least, it, for example, in the farm bill, we actually got um, four years worth of about um, uh, gosh, about four hundred million dollars additional money for our farmers over the last uh, four years, specifically for the Chesapeake Bay. Is that is that the answer? No, We're, we need billions out there. So it's trying to use our federal dollars as best we can. Um, the president actually signed an executive order on the Chesapeake Bay that tried to say, hey, federal partners, you need to figure out Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife, NOAA. USGS, how to spend your dollars and your time and effort that much more effectively. It's certainly picking up on local um, dollars and looking at our local econ local folks to try to tr do more innovative things. A lot of our uh, local um, municipalities are looking at stormwater utilities because we've got a tremendous amount of stormwater issues that are, have a local impact, much less a Chesapeake Bay impact, and as, as well as our states, for example, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and then recently West Virginia. Never thought it would happen in West Virginia, but they figured out, in the case of West Virginia, to take lottery money and actually use it to upgrade their local treatment plants. Virginia uses surplus money, which they actually do have it occasionally, to fund wastewater treatment plants and uh, conservation practices with their farmers. Maryland actually uses a flush fee, um, takes it out of, I think, $30 that I have to pay extra to then upgrade their 56 wastewater treatment plants and uh, fund their cover crop program. So in addition to sort of the, the myriad of other things, what we've seen slowly but surely is more ingenious ways of folks going about doing the financing of it, it's saying you can't squeeze an extra dollar out of there, how do you then try to, to, um, to do it across the board, but let folks know what it's going for, tell them that in fact here's the benefit it, that it happened for a local economy, and so that they know the next time you ask for that, that it, it, it'll be there. I was, <coughs> excuse me, I was curious what tools or mechanisms you used that allowed you to threaten Timmy with 10 minutes with Mr. Whiskers. <laughs> good, good question. What we have to do is have to have to take a look at our, our under the, the Clean Water Act, EPA has the authority to regulate point sources, wastewater treatment plants, industrial, municipal, um, stormwater. It's it's defined for MS4s and confined animal feeding operations, concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs. So under those pieces, that that's been a strong one of saying, hey, listen, guys, if you didn't show on your your non-regulated, non-point source efforts how you can do that, we said we could squeeze those regulated sources. We can look at funding. We can look at expanding, for example, in, as I mentioned, in the urban stormwater side, there's a what we call a uh, uh, residual designated use authority that we can actually expand the amount of area in a municipality that's covered by urban stormwater regulations themselves. So it's sort of expanding the area. We can do the same thing on the CAFO side. Those are not popular, and those are saying, guys, we only put that up to get you motivated to make it, if it makes it local, if the state does it, it's a lot more effective. If EPA ends up doing it, we've all lost we have done the wrong thing. So it's essentially taking those existing authorities and applying them, funding, um, regulatory authorities, or ability to expand the regulated sources. When you did your allocation for urban runoff and you seemed to reach a ceiling where you couldn't get any further down, what percentage of uh, the stormwater was put into stormwater detention and retention ponding by that point? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have it off the top of my um, head. I think actually our stormwater community wants to move away from dry ponds and wet ponds, go more for il infiltration, um, rooftop in terms of green roofs, to try to get that done because they found it's a lot more cheaper. It actually benefits that local site a lot more. Working with our commercial and, and housing development guys, they're saying, you know, taking that extra big wet pond and stuff means I have to put a fence, it's ugly, you have to maintain it. How are you gonna get a homeowners association to do that? But if I, in fact, infiltrate it, if I do rain gardens, if I do swales and stuff, I actually leave that community, if it's a new one or a, a redeveloped area, with something that's going to maintain itself. I don't have that information, but that, that, some of that information is available out there. If not, 
email me and I can uh, talk to our stormwater folks and get you an answer. But that's a great question. Yes, sir. Rich, in one of your slides, you demonstrated some significant reductions in wastewater phosphorus loading mm -hmm. already. What are typical phosphorus effluent limits that you are now implementing it as a part of this whole effort? Folks are either at or getting to around 0.3 to 0.1 or even lower in terms of phosphorus effluent. 0.3 to 0.1. 0.3 to 0.1. In the case of nitrogen, um, some of our states, Maryland, Virginia, D.C., Delaware, are getting around uh, 3 to 4 milligrams per liter nitrogen. New York, uh, Pennsylvania, are looking at 5 to 6. But that's moving from, in some cases, we had 1 milligram per liter of phosphorus coming in, or 15 to 35 in the case of nitrogen. Yes, sir. Uh, you have so many information here to try to keep up with it. It's <laughs> tough for us for a short time. But on the agricultural thing, that what you've done and you know, with uh, keeping the cattle away from the water and things. But you made the statement that they're going more organic. When I go into my ranch store, I pay more for the food. What was the reason you said they will go to more organic, which is better? I, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just using that one example. There's, a, I think, a group up in Cortland County that was, um, in the case of their dairy herd, they were trying to go more organic because, uh, speaking with the producer, she indicated that um, she could actually get a better price per pound for, for her milk. Um, by the practices she put in place, she didn't have as much help, need as much uh, farm help out there. By uh, fencing out her dairy, out of that, she, her vet bills actually went down because they weren't cutting their feet. They weren't drinking some of the um, harmful algal blooms out of the local creek and stuff like that. She was just taking a different approach where she thought, saw a niche market up there. I didn't mean to say everybody was going organic, but it was just interesting watching that producer. Uh, it was part of a farm day that we went out there. She listed eight things or reasons why she did it, and her ninth one was well, she's helping the local streams in the Chesapeake Bay itself. So it's just watching the producers out there. These are, very, I mean, talking to thousands of them, these are folks that they know the land, they know the waters and stuff like that. They also have a very thin margin in which they want to get their income on there. There's got to be better ways of us doing that. But I've seen a lot of the approaches out here, like no-till, like going with the, uh, the phytase, it helps their bottom line. It's not just good for the environment. Yes, sir. Uh, Rich, you talked early on about the sources of nitrogen and you showed the, the pie chart you had up there. Can you talk a little bit about the science behind that and, and how that was developed? Sure, that's a great question. Um, to do a pie chart like that is a combination of monitoring data and modeling data. Uh, it, it based off our watershed models. So for example, the sources that we can actually directly monitor, it's principally our wastewater treatment facilities. So in those cases, we get a direct measure right out of the effluent of what's coming on there. But the loads that I showed you are actually delivered. So we had to even take those wastewater treatment loads, we had to attenuate them. In other words, have them naturally reduce as they go through the stream system and eventually into the Chesapeake Bay. In the case of nitrogen, there's processes that actually remove it off as nitrogen gas. Phosphorus, most of that stuff is actually eventually going to get there, but it could be 100 years as it works its way through there. A lot of the other sources were um, some of it direct measurement like atmospheric deposition, but then applying that deposition onto a farm field or into a forest and then using our best science to indicate how much of that got into the watershed itself. So it was really using that, that Chesapeake Bay watershed model with good information on land uses, where the practices were put in place, where the upgrades of treatment plants, and then what eventually comes into the Chesapeake Bay on that one. And then in the case of atmospheric deposition, backing it out, we're able to then back out how much comes from Ohio, how much comes from power plants by using our airshed model as well. Uh, you talked a lot about... Um, Whoops, where are you? I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, what, they added, what about the District of Columbia and their stormwater? What's their expectations? Their expectations actually is that um, if you look at their land area, they've got a lot of federal property there. Um, so one of the things that they've done and we've actually done is we actually got the federal government, God forbid, uh, was saying, we're not going to pay. The district actually has a, a, a fee per square foot of impervious surface, a really unique approach that they're doing. So essentially, if you're a commercial or you're a government agency, you pay a fee to, to the district so that they can put in green roofs. I think they're second behind Chicago and Portland in terms of the amount of green roofs that they have in there. Uh, but I, so that one of the things we did is we had to convince the feds of you are part of the watershed. The, the, executive, count, uh, the executive order of the president brought you in here. How, in fact, are you going to get captured under there? Now the feds are going to actually be paying part of this, this impervious surface fee in there. The district is using that. Um, to then do retrofits, but and more along the lines of the gentleman asked up here, not in terms of trying to put more stormwater retention ponds. How are you going to do that on the National Mall or in the White House and stuff like that? They're looking at infiltration. They're looking at evaporation. They're actually 
going through a complete redevelopment in, in downtown D.C. over the last 15 years or now because they call the national bird down there is actually the crane. It's not the whooping crane or what you guys have up here. It's actually the crane that goes around and builds a building. So walk anywhere down there. So they're actually using that opportunity and they're seeing more per square city block of new green buildings that are coming in there as well. So a tremendous amount of emphasis on infiltrating it, keeping on that rooftop, doing it, and then putting green buildings in as they're coming in there and, and essentially challenging feds and commercial folks. And now what they're doing, the commercial people are actually saying they're getting a better price per square foot of people wanting to come in into a green building down in D.C. now than they had before. So it's a really unique opportunity. Rich, we'll take two more questions. Remind everybody that he'll be here later to answer questions and hear your questions. Is the, uh, in the whole basin, um, what percent is forested versus ag and urban now? That relates to your chart you had. I think it was nitrate loss from forest. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, about Just about under 60% is forested still. Um, we are losing some of our forest, looking at working with our U.S. Forest Service and our state foresters, but we're still about 60%. I think about 25 to 30% is ag still. Again, we're, unfortunately, we're still losing. I moved some, some pictures out there that showed we're actually sort of doing what call, folks call the exurban areas. They're moving that much further um, outside of the commuting distances to then take up the ag areas. And then in terms of the developed lands, around 10% now and growing. As you yes, were developing your implementation plans and coming up with your best management practices, how are you uh, assuring the farmers and producers that the best management practices that they would be having the implement would actually work and would be and would not affect their bottom line as they try and produce food for a hungry world where in re respect to the cities and municipalities if they have to do an implementation plan or a best management practice that may cost some money they always have the ability to pass that cost down to the residents and to the taxpayers whereas a farmer as an individual who sells his product at a wholesale value buys his inputs at retail sells stuff at wholesale you know how can you be giving them reasonable assurance that them best management practices will work in every given condition being that the landscape is different in every sub watershed mm -hmm. and now some practices will work won't work depends on the weather and, and different uh, occurrences that's an outstanding question um the major answer to it is cornell university penn state university west virginia university university of maryland in other words we really rely on our land-grant universities folks in our that then run our cooperative extension services. We've got about 10 land-grant universities to help us define, for example, um, riparian forest buffers. Uh, we, we have a series of agreed to among the six states in the district efficiencies. In other words, if I put a riparian forest buffer, say it's a 30-foot buffer or a 100-foot buffer, what kind of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment reduction would it give? We don't have just one efficiency. We actually have it, as you're saying, a, a riparian forest buffer in New York portion of the basin is going to work differently than one on the Shenandoah than on the, on the eastern shore. Our science indicates that. Um, cover crops, we actually, depending on whether it's, it's rye or another seed, depending on when they plant it, how they plant it, there's a different efficiency that our land grant universities have said there too. That question is important because one of the things that we're trying to do in the TMDL and that is get our producers another source of income. In other words, if he or she has put a certain baseline of practices in place, part of it cost share, part of it coming out of their own wallet, um, and as you say, under these world markets, that's a very thin margin there. If they actually put additional practices in place, they can actually trade or get money from those municipalities downstream for putting those practices in place because they're, they're cheaper and they actually have a local benefit to that uh, producer as well. And that producer actually then gains from that. So they can use their cost share, but also get paid by others to actually put those practices in place. We can talk further about that, but that's an excellent question, sir. with us throughout the day. Great.